If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And good morning, everyone. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Adam, and I'm also one of the ministers here. We're beginning this series in 1 Corinthians 13, this love, love, love series, as, as Rich was saying. Uh, but it's God's word, and so before we approach uh, listening to it, let's approach God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that all of us here who are trusting in your Son can say that the Son of God loved me and gave himself up for me. Lords, moved by your love for us, might you give us hearts this morning that are overflowing in love for you and overflowing in love for each other. Grant us ears that we might hear and grow in love for you and ears that we might hear and grow in love for each other. And we pray this in the Lord's Jesus name. Amen. Well, let me tell you about something that happened to me several years ago. It was the beginning of 2016. Uh, and for a number of years before this, I had been weighing up whether or not I should stop what I was doing and start working for the church as a ministry trainee. That my minister, uh, Richard Perkins, he'd, he'd sort of kicked the ball off in my head. He got me thinking about it. I'd been talking to people. I'd been praying about it. And at the beginning of 2016, it was getting serious. I knew I needed to make a decision soon. Uh, and so Richards, my minister at the time, uh, met up with me and he uh, invited me around to his house for dinner. It was me and Pauline and him and his wife so that we could talk about this further. And during the course of the dinner, at one stage, he turned and he asked me, why do you want to become a ministry trainee? And I said because I enjoy teaching the Bible, or something to that effect anyway, because I enjoy teaching the Bible. And what did Richard say? He didn't say, great, on, you can start whenever you want, right? He didn't say that. Instead, he explained that he had seen a number of men go into ministry because they enjoy teaching the Bible and fairly quickly find themselves coming unstuck because that was all, because they enjoyed teaching the Bible. And you might be wondering, well, what's the problem with my answer? People need to hear the Bible taught, don't they? The Bible is God's words, and it's great that we can hear it taught and explained. But beware. There's a trap here, and it's a trap that's easy for us to stumble into because it's easy to stand in the corridor after you preach a sermon and to have people come up to you and say, oh, that was a great sermon. Oh, you explained that really well. I didn't understand it. And to feel really good about that or to be given a tricky Bible passage and, and think about it and mull over it and go through the process so it becomes an effective sermon that, that people hear and understand and, and, and see how it connects to their lives. It's easy to enjoy that process, but that's all. And it's not just me that's in danger of this kind of thing. We, we all can do it as well. We can sing in the band because we enjoy singing we can pray at the front because, well, we enjoy writing eloquent prayers and we enjoy the attention that it gives us. We can lead a life group, well, because we, pref we prefer to lead a life group than be led in one. We can welcome at the door because we enjoy that kind of thrill you get from meeting someone new and, and the sense of just, I'm on the inside of the church community and I'm the one that gets to sort of reach out my hand and welcome you in. We can come along to church because we love the support that, that people give us in church and the, and the atmosphere and the community that we have here. We can even speak to our friends and neighbors about the Lord Jesus. And we can do so because we like showing we've got the right answers. Because we like being the kind of the guru that people can come to with their problems and their questions. And we've 
got, uh, we can show them the right way. So picture that dinner table again. Picture there's me and there's Polly and there's my old minister Richard and there's his wife. Imagine the apostle Paul were to come in. He would sit down at the dinner table. And he, he hears the conversation that's going on. He hears what I said about, because I enjoy teaching the Bible. He hears what Richard said about, oh, you know, warning me about that. And what would he say? Well, I think it's here in our passage, in these three verses that we're about to look at. Because he'd say, you can do any of these things, right? You can preach, you can pray, you can perform. But if you do anything at all without love, you are nothing. You're nothing. That's what we're going to see this morning. And as that challenge rings in our ears, let's just take a moment to consider where we are and why we're thinking about love this morning. Well, we're beginning this series in 1 Corinthians 13, and as we heard it read this morning, it's a very famous passage, isn't it? We've probably all been to weddings where you've heard this passage read. And so it's a privilege that we have four weeks now to look at it in depth and to go through it sort of two verses at a time, two or three verses at a time. But it's a famous passage that comes in a particular place in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's not just written out of the blue. It's not kind of Paul's, here's a few things you could write in your next Valentine's Day card. And it's not even really about love and marriage. Well, it certainly it has got lots to say to that, but it's not principally what it's about. It's about how we love each other here in church. Because here's the thing, the, the Corinthians are constantly competing with each other. That's the kind of their, their default mode. They're always competing. It's who had the best clique, who had the most money, who had the most spectacular gifts. Paul's had to deal with all of these questions up until you know, in the chapters 1 through to 12. And if you just open your Bibles and take a look at the end of chapter 12, Rich read a little bit of it for us earlier, but we're going to go to verses 28 to the end. Because what Paul does in verse 28 is he lists gifts that the Corinthians had. In fact, he's done this twice in this one chapter. He's list two, given two lists. And the Corinthians are listening to this list. You know, they're, they're hearing about apostles and prophets and teachers and miracle workers and all of these things. And they're probably thinking to themselves, great, Paul tells me that I need to eagerly desire the greatest gifts in verse 31, right? How can I get another foot up the ladder? How can I go so I can be a teacher? How can I go a little bit further up so I can be a, you know, a person who's got the gift of miracles or something like this? So I can be the greatest, get the greatest gift. But see what Paul says in the end of verse 31? What's the greatest gift? What's the most excellent way? Well, we'll see that in our passage. That's what he's introducing us to now. So what is this greatest gift? Well, we'll see in our first point and in verse one that speaking without love makes us an irritating noise. Speaking without love makes us an irritating noise. So look at verse one. And Paul starts talking about if I speak in the tongues of men. And what Paul's going to do in each of these verses is he's going to take something that the Corinthians could do and then he's going to go to an extreme example, something outlandish, almost crazy, that's um, way out of the ordinary for his second example. So Paul certainly can speak in the tongues of men. But second example, if I could speak in the tongues of angels, even if he could ascend into heaven, even if he could grasp the words that beings around the throne of God are using to praise God at the minute, if he could speak in that in eloquence and deliver the, the greatest oration ever known, well, here's the key bit. Even still, even with that amazing gift, it wouldn't be the greatest gift. It wouldn't be the most excellent way. Because if he does all of that and has no love, then he is no better than a squeal of feedback coming from the PA system. He is a toneless vibration, a pointless cacophony, a jarring note He's like the dog that barks outside your window at night and keeps you awake. Or the, the workers digging up the road in front of your office when you're trying to concentrate. I see this as well. Let's see what God says. It's not if Paul were to speak in the tongues of men or angels, then his words would be pointless. We kind of expect that, wouldn't we? No, it's 
Paul himself who would be the irritating noise. Here's how a great reformer, John Calvin, from the 16th century put, put this. He said, make yourself master of all the languages, not of men merely, but of angels. You have in that case no reason to think that you are of higher estimation in the sight of God than a mere symbol if you have not love. And isn't this exactly what Richard Perkins was warning me of in that conversation? Because if I stand up here and preach just because I like teaching people or for any other reason for that matter, it does not matter if you all come up to me afterwards and say how great a sermon it was. It doesn't matter if this is the last word in this passage and everybody who ever preaches ever again in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3 refers to this sermon. It doesn't matter if it goes viral on YouTube. It doesn't matter if people think of it as the most inspiring thing that they heard since Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. It doesn't matter if people are analyzing this for hundreds of years afterwards as a masterpiece of English. If I do so without love, I'm just an irritating noise. Again, it's not just me in this danger. Every time we, we speak, we have it. Wherever we fall on the gift, the gift spectrum of giftings of speech, because we can pray at the front just because we like crafting those eloquent prayers. We can love meeting people and speaking to them about Jesus just because we like to enjoy being the guru as we were thinking about earlier. And there are no exceptions. You might think you could speak the best kind of things, right? What would be the best kind of things to say? Well, you could tell someone about Jesus. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? And indeed you could. And maybe the person that you're speaking to uh, about the Lord Jesus comes to believe in him and repents, and that's wonderful. But they're not doing it because of your words. They're doing it in spite of your words if you're doing it without love. Paul starts here by focusing on the gifts of speech in a church. Those were big deals for uh, the Corinthians. In fact, the whole of chapter 14 is going to be devoted to that as well. But love as the greatest gift impacts not just the way we speak, but impacts lots of other areas of life as well. And we begin to see that in verse 2. Our second point, performing the miraculous without love makes us nothing. We're nothing more than a jarring note if we speak without love. So what if we did amazing things, right? Surely that would make something of us. That must be what the Corinthians are thinking. But here's what Paul says. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. The Corinthian church had men and women who had the gift of prophecy. We saw that in chapter 11 if we were reading through, and Paul will spend a good while talking about it in chapter 14. But again, see Paul's strategy. He argues from a gift that people did have to the amazing, the spectacular, the, the almost impossible, because... Well, there were definitely prophets in Corinth, but you couldn't have gone up to them and asked the finer points of quantum mechanics or the details of events 2,000 years in the future or every single um, little bit of, of knowledge that you could possibly want about God's plan and God's ways. You couldn't have asked them all of those things and expected they got, they'd know the answer each and every time. Again, there are people with the gift of faith in Corinth. This gift of faith isn't the same as saving faith. Saving faith is also a gift. It's, but this is the kind of a special, a bold, a trustful faith, even in, this, in problems and difficulties that might seem intractable and problems and difficulties that might crop up in someone's life where many of us will be doubting and fearing. But even if we could do these amazing things, these miraculous things, even if newspaper reporters were lining up to interview us because the words got out about what we did, even if we'd be making headline news all around the world, even if people were viewing our whatever it was we were doing on YouTube and we have loads of followers on social media, if we did all of those things, what would we be in God's eyes without love? Nothing. Nothing at all. Worthless. The bottom of the pile. That normal person who goes to church each Sunday and who loves the Lord Jesus and who loves the people around them and never seems to do anything very miraculous, that normal person is something. The person who does thousands of miracles without love is nothing. 
Speech without love makes us an irritating noise. The miraculous without love makes us nothing. And we come now to verse 3, and in some ways a bit down to earth from the heights of verse 2, because we'll see that sacrificing for others without love makes us losers. Here's what Paul says. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Again, here Paul's strategy. If I give all my possessions to the poor, well, that seems fairly drastic, fairly difficult, but it's definitely something that Christians throughout the years have done. But again, we move from the possible to the extreme. If we were to give everything that we had away, give our lives so that we put our whole selves at the disposal of others and hold nothing back, what would that make us? It makes us losers without love. We would give and give and give and receive nothing in return without love in God's eyes. Our sacrifice for others, our help given to others, our service of other people's needs, no matter how time consuming, no matter how costly, no matter how much money we spend, not a single bit of it will benefit us in the long run without love. And that's hard to hear, isn't it? Because it means there's a way of serving other people that looks great. The way that people might see us and praise us for. A way that might cost a huge amount, but that God looks on as worthless. And isn't that the kind of thing that we were thinking about in the start as, as well? When we serve by singing in the band because we enjoy singing and not out of love for the, the people that we're leading. When we serve by being a life group leader because we prefer to lead rather than be led in one. Or when we welcome at the door because we like that feeling of being on the inside and getting to, we be the one that holds out the hand and welcomes someone else. When we come along to church because we receive love ourselves. Or when we, when we do all of these things, we, we don't profit by any of them. Because God is not pleased with our motives. I've got another quote this morning. It's from a, a church father, John Chrysostom. Uh, he summarized what we've seen but so far. He said, all other things have their evils yoked with them. It's all the other gifts he's thinking about. The person who gives up their possessions is often puffed up on this account. The eloquent person is afflicted with a wild passion for their glory. The humble-minded person on this very ground not seldom thinks highly of themselves in their conscience. But love is free from every such mischief. For no one could ever be lifted up against the person whom they love. What's criticism saying? Well, as we saw, speech without love makes us an irritating noise. The miraculous without love makes us nothing. Service without love makes us losers. These gifts all come with their dangers. And the greater the gift, the more that people might look at it and want to admire it and celebrate it and, uh, and think, very praise it. The greater the gift, the greater the danger. But the greatest gift of all, the most excellent way, the way of love, love is free from every such mischief because love doesn't care about ourselves. It cares about others, doesn't it? Great gifts are only safe in the hands of those who love others greatly. And don't we see this love again and again in the life of the Lord Jesus? Think about the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he's gone into the wilderness and he's being tempted by Satan. Satan gives him three temptations. The first one is that he would use his words, his speech, to turn stones into bread. And Jesus could have done that, couldn't he? He could have used the power, the gift of his speech to turn the stones into bread and relieved his hunger. But no, I love for God, I love for us whom he came to serve, Jesus didn't use his words selfishly. The second was that Satan took him to the the top of the temple and tempted him to throw himself off. And Jesus could have done that to amaze the crowds with the miraculous, right? As legions of angels appear to catch Jesus and rescue him from his fall. But no, out of love for God and, and love for us whom he came to serve, Jesus, well, he very often displayed his power secretly, didn't he? Only a few saw it. Those who did saw it, he commanded not to tell. 
And he never used his power just to dazzle crowds. And the third temptation, that Satan said that if he, Jesus were to bow down and worship him, he would become the vice regent with Satan over the world. But no, again, Jesus didn't do it. Out of love for God and, and love for us whom he came to serve, what did Jesus say? He chose to forgo that kind of self-seeking glory and worship God and serve him only. He's used his service for God's glory and for our good. As we listen to these verses, we might find ourselves, I guess, in one of three situations. Firstly, there are many of us who are wonderfully and self-sacrificially and self-forgetfully loving and serving the church family here. It might be the, the loving care that you give to your husband or your wife or your child, often that no one else sees. You get no credit for it in the eyes uh, of everyone here, and yet God sees it. And God will make sure that you profit from it in his eyes. Or here's another example. Every Thursday evening at the base, the leaders gather around to, to pray for the evening that's about to happen. And I'm always really encouraged by the prayers because the leaders are, what do they pray for? They pray that they would love the young people who come along well, that they love them well as they have fun with them, and love them well, especially as they speak to them about the Lord Jesus. Maybe it's in the faithful visit that you do with the elderly person who, who can't come to church anymore. Uh, maybe it's uh, the people, uh, the way you show love is having people around to your house for lunch after church and perhaps especially people who you know can't return the invite. Well, isn't it wonderful to, that we can think of examples of people who love just like that, who use their, their words lovingly, loving speech, who use their actions lovingly, have loving actions in the church. So be encouraged. God sees this. He sees it more than I do. He sees it more than anyone else does. You're not an irritating noise in God's ears when out of love and compassion you're speaking to someone about the Lord Jesus. You are somebody worth noticing, not because you've done any amazing deeds, but because you have humbly trusted God through all the circumstances of your life. And all your sacrifices your hard work, the time given up, the energy that you've put in to lovingly serve God's people, that is credited to you in God's eyes. So praise God that so many of us are living lives in such a loving way. But it might be that as we heard this passage, something else came to our minds, right? Right? It might be that we heard it and we started thinking of ways that we are serving the church and we know in our hearts it's just for show. How do we know that? Well, we know it because it really grates when we do something and nobody says thank you. Or when we really struggle when no one compliments us after we've done something. We've worked really hard and we've not been noticed. Or we do things maybe so that we would have that feeling of being the dependable one, right? The one that everybody can rely on. You know, they, they can ask so-and-so to do that and they'll get it done. And we enjoy that feeling of it and that's it. Or maybe we know that we're serving out of, not out of love because, well, in us it comes out in anxiety. We're anxious because when it's our turn in the prayer rota because we're worried, well, what, what if we slip up and we say something wrong? We're anxious before we come to the CCC to cook because, well, what if we mess up and we look bad? Whether service or our speech are motivated by trying to impress or, or they're crushed by anxiety of failure, well, neither is a response motivated by love. Neither is a response that forgets about ourselves and, and puts others first. If that's us and that's how we're serving and we're doing so without love, well, probably the best thing we can do is just take a break has to come off the road for a bit. It has to, to leave the team for a while. Because our service is nothing but a tinny noise that profits us nothing in God's eyes. We'd be better to stop. And if we're thinking here, oh, I could never do that. I could never leave the team. I could never have that conversation. What would people think about me? Well, if that's what we're thinking in our hearts, then it's all the more reason to stop because we're not serving out of love if that's what's going on in our attitudes. 
That's the second group. Here, here's the third group, and I imagine this is most of us. It's a group of us who have good days and bad days, right? Who in our better moments are serving in our ministries out of love or speaking to our neighbors or caring for our, our families out of that deep self-sacrificial love. And we have bad days when we aren't, right? When we get frustrated and angry, when we should be patient and compassionate, when we get excited about others thinking well of us, when we should be thinking well of others instead, when we want to be noticed and applauded and known for our consistent love, well, if that's us, then here's the great news of this passage, because we can grow in love. Isn't this exactly why Paul wrote these verses? So that the Corinthians might do what he says and pursue the most excellent way, might long to be better at it, might long for the greatest gift of love. So let's pray that we do grow in love for each other here. That's what I needed to do when I sat at that table with Richards and he said, why do you want to become a ministry trainee? I needed to go away and pray that I would grow in love for God's people. I needed to ask myself and make sure that I wasn't serving God's people for anything I could get out of it, but out of love. I still need to do that. That's how Jesus loved and served us. That's how I should serve you and we should serve each other. So praise God that we can grow in love for others. Praise him that, that he can change us. He can turn our hearts from our selfish ways to genuinely looking out for and loving our neighbors. And do pray that he would be at work in you. Pray that more, and in me that, that more and more everything we do would be motivated by love. So that's three groups we might be in. I've got one thing to, for us to do, and that's come back next week eagerly. This week, we've kind of seen the negative of what, what love is not like. Next week, we begin to unpack the positive. What is love actually look like when you put it into practice? So come along next week eagerly, and we'll see how concretely we can grow in love for the church family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do confess that all too often... Uh, we serve you, we serve the people around us, uh, we speak in, in ways as well that are just for us, that are just to make us look good, are just for our own glory. They're not motivated by love. Lord, help us to earnestly desire that, that best way, that greatest way to look for the gift of love, to pray for it, to grow in it, that we might think less of ourselves. We might think less of, um, of how our words are, reflect on us and what people are thinking about us or less about uh, what people are thinking about how we're serving and that we might think of others more and love them and put them first. Thank you that we do this as part of your body, the church. And thank you we do this as those loved by you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.